I'm going to thank the witnesses for their testimony, and now we're going to go to questions. You can see the enormous interest of the committee that we have 24 of our 30 senators uh, who are members of this committee uh, that are participating. Um, it will be led off by myself and Senator Shelby, followed by Senators Tester and Alexander, Udall and Moran, Murray and Collins, Merkley and Johans. That's the first hour. Uh, and I can go to the second hour, but we're going to move right along here. Um, I would like to go to the testimony of the written testimony of Secretary Johnson. And I really ask my colleagues on the committee to turn to page two, uh, the second paragraph. Uh, what this says is without the supplemental funding in August, and then Mr. Secretary, you elaborate on what will happen uh, if we do not pass the supplemental. So I'd ask my colleagues to look at it, but I'm gonna go to you, Secretary Burrell. If you're, of the one point, of the 3.7 billion, 1.8 billion is at HHS. Now, if we don't pass this supplemental by August, what will happen, and though you gave a compelling narrative about the situation of the children, but what is it that you need $1.8 billion to buy? Uh, and that's what America's middle class are asking. We are worried about these children, but back home, they're worried about their children. Could you tell us why this is urgent, what you need to 1.8, and what happens if we don't do this supplemental? The uh, money for HHS is purely for the care of the children, and we generally refer that to that as beds, and 84 percent of that we say is for beds for the children, and 12 percent for other services, and 2 percent just in terms of administrative cost over time. But with regard to when we say a bed, what we mean is actually the full care for the ch child, and I assume that we're going to talk about that throughout the hearing today in terms of whether that's the fact that all of those children receive a wellness exam, and that's important to the public health of our nation, it's important to the public health of those children. Each of those children also receive mental health interviews. As we've talked about, these children have been in some of them very tragic situations and we need to make sure that as we place those children, we consider uh, those types of things. The child is in our care. In addition, we are not putting an additional burden on the communities when the child is in our care. When the child is in our care, uh, we actually do many of the health examinations as part, of our, uh, as part of our system where the child is. In addition, we are educating and providing some educational components for those children so they are not in the system. And so the cost for us in terms of the overarching cost is really about the care. The 12% are other services. Those are legal services and certain health services that go beyond what we provide. So if a child actually has a situation that requires medical attention that is beyond basic child welfare that the physicians and uh, other medical attendants can take care of and the child must go to a hospital, we pay for that care. The federal government and part of HHS's responsibility pays for that care. <clears throat> In addition are the costs that we're talking about when we say the legal costs. The type of assistance that we pay is what we pay is for the children when they come in to receive materials, and sometimes those are done by video, and sometimes those are done in person, and they receive two types of information. One, the children come to understand and know their rights and protections that they have as part of this process. The second thing is the children are actually taught, and it is explained, what the immigration proceedings that they will face will be. For some of the children, we do additional supplemental group education sessions where they can ask questions, and over time for certain children that have special needs. That is what the money is for. So what happens is, while Ambassador Shannon and the State Department are supposed to be encouraging people not to come, and I think the fact that it's a little, not enough money for going after the gangs, they meet the Border Patrol, so, and then they come to you while their legal status is being determined. Now, this then goes to this. So if we don't pass this bill before this August recess, 
What happens? So for us, there are two things that I think are important in terms of the time sensitivity. If we continue on the current trajectory that we saw in May, June, what happened in May and June is that the number of children that came through DHS exceeded the number of beds that we had available at HHS. And what that means is that those children, whenever that number exceeds, those children are at the border. And those children are in detention and holding pens until we can move them. And so the ability of HHS, so if we stay on the current trajectory, and we are actually doing pilots to try and speed our process, we are doing everything we can, there are three variables. Number of kids, number of beds, speed with which HHS can move the children. We're working on that speed as much as we can, but we need to do this in a safe and secure way. And what it is about is in August, if we continue on the May-June trajectory, the ability for HHS to bring on beds so that we no longer have more coming in than I can process at HHS and our teams can on a daily basis, they will be backed up uh, at the borders. The other thing, just from the an economic Secret perspective. Can we go, and then what happens to you at the border? Um, Senator, because of the recent spike in migration, we've had to surge within ICE transportation cost and the cost of building increased detention capability, most notably from the family units. To be honest, ICE uh, had very, very few beds for family unit detention capability, and we've had to build more to deal with this, to send people back quicker. Um, the Border Patrol has been working overtime, so we've incurred those overtime costs, as well as simply the cost of caring for all the children at the border. And so, as I said earlier, at the current burn rate, uh, ICE is going to run out of money in mid-August, and we project that CBP is going to run out of money in mid-September. If there is no supplemental, we're going to have to go to some very <coughs> dramatic, harsh form of reprogramming, which I'm sure the committee is familiar with, away from some vital homeland security programs that I'm sure members of this committee care a lot about. So that, or risk anti-deficiency act violations, which uh, is intolerable to me. So, so that's the situation we face. With my time expired, the fact is that the failure to act does not save money for the taxpayer. What it essentially does is back up the, the ability of these children to be in a safe and secure surrounding. They will be in primarily at the border with Border Patrol agents who are law enforcement, dedicated law enforcement people in situations that are in facilities that were never meant to house children. So they have overcrowding, poor sanitation, a variety of things there. So that would be a big choke point. And you have to start reprogramming money from what really Homeland, other Homeland Security, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Well, again, please go to page two of his testimony, of the Secretary Johnson. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Senator Shelby, but before I do, I just want to say one thing. I've seen now into action the people caring for the children at Gacklin, a faith-based organization under contract. I've seen what your border control people are doing. I get a sense of this. I just really want to thank all of the men and women who work for our government and those fantastic Faith-based organizations are going to the border and others reaching out to you for the way they are really trying to meet this in a way that is humane, legal, but ultimately we need to prevent a way of these children continually being exploited by the traffickers. Senator Shelby. Thank you. Um, 